This episode contains content related to sexual assault and suicide. Please listen with care. I want to tell you a story. It's a story about two women, seemingly without connection, separated by hundreds of years. It's a story about a daughter of a wealthy landowner who's assaulted by a man of privilege. This is where Dinah was with Jacob, her dad, and the text in Genesis Chapter 34 tells us that her father didn't do anything about it. It's also a story about a woman who lived hundreds of years later in a religious society that didn't value women and whose past made her an outcast, an object of vulnerability. And here I am talking about this woman at the well, and I'm thinking, oh, I've I've experienced this too, you know? And I have been redeemed and loved back by this man called Jesus. What could possibly connect Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, whose traumatic story unfolds in a place called Shechem, and the Samaritan woman, who famously encounters Jesus at a well outside her hometown of Sychar? Here's the answer. Shechem and Sychar are the very same place. I'm Kat Armstrong, and you're listening to Holy Curiosity, a podcast highlighting the genius storytelling of God from the Old Testament to the New. Each week, we'll explore storied connections threaded throughout Scripture. My hope is that these stories will spark a holy curiosity in your own faith, because once you see these connections, you can't unsee them. God wastes no person, place, or thing. In these first episodes, we're going to uncover the powerful connection between two women in the Bible, Dinah and the woman at the well. You've likely never heard a sermon preached about Dinah because her story is one of unspeakable trauma and anguish. She's a victim of rape, an act that forever scarred her life. I spent a lot of time with this story when I wrote my book, The In-Between Place. It was incredibly impactful in my life and taught me a lot about being curious about the redemptive story of God. Here's what happens to Dinah in Genesis chapter 34. Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, is raped in Shechem by a man named Shechem. The prince's son, Shechem, spots her, steals her, and attacks her. And it's at this point in the biblical story that this place becomes a corner of the earth where unspeakable violence towards women has happened and where silence about sexual violence becomes the status quo. He takes her innocence, but that wasn't enough for Shechem. He becomes obsessed with Dinah, and he enlists his father, Hamer, who's in charge of the whole place, to help him keep her under his power forever. He says he wants her as his wife. And when Jacob, Dinah's father, the father of our faith, hears that his daughter has been defiled, he keeps silent. Dinah's brothers, on the other hand, they're furious, they're enraged by the disgrace, and so they strike a deal between Jacob and his sons and Shechem the rapist and his dad regarding the fate of Dinah. She ends up marrying Shechem, her rapist, but in turn, the terms of the deal are that Shechem and Hamer and the rest of the city, they're going to have to be circumcised. In the terms of these negotiations, they were just simply a ploy to give Dinah's brothers an advantage as they schemed for her revenge. So Hamer and Shechem and the rest of the people in this town would have just had their surgeries, their circumcision. So they're unable to defend themselves from Dinah's brothers when they attack. And the brothers' plan works. Genesis 34 ends with mass murder and more women being brutalized. I think an interesting point we need to look at is Jacob, Dinah's dad. He seems unconcerned with Dinah's pain. And then he reprimands his son's behaviors with scolding remarks about how the revenge would bring trouble on himself. We never hear Dinah's voice. We never hear her perspective. We never see Jacob talk about the story again. Dinah may have been a forgotten victim in her story, 
but it's a reminder that no voice should be left unheard. And here's the thing, although you've likely never heard a message preached about Dinah from Genesis 34, I bet you've heard a lot of messages about the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Both Dinah and the Samaritan woman's stories involve significant events that take place in Shechem, but the connection's much more than that. It's not like me saying, I'm a true Houstonian. I was born and raised there, y'all. And there's some pride in being from H-Town, right? That's where Beyonce is from and Jennifer Garner and Kenny Rogers. But the hometown connection I want you to see between Dinah and the woman at the well is nothing like me saying, I'm from Houston and so is Beyonce. The thing that connects Dinah and the Samaritan woman are the lingering effects that pain and trauma can have on a place, on a geographical location. What we're going to do over the next few episodes is we're going to connect their stories. And I'm going to show you how Jesus brings redemption and dignity to a place of pain and brokenness. And he's not just bringing redemption to some ancient places on a biblical map called Shechem. He is doing the same for our places of pain, our places of brokenness. In the Old Testament, Shechem is called Shechem, but in the New, it's called Sikar. Shechem, Sikar, same place. For all the alliteration fans out there, Shechem and Sikar were both located in Samaria. And maybe Samaria rings a bell for you because you remember Jesus saying that the gospel will go from Jerusalem to Judea and then through Samaria before going to the ends of the earth. And until I stood, in modern-day Samaria and overlook the ancient city of Shechem with my very own eyes, I assume that Shechem was a distant, ancient place with zero relevance to my life or yours. And then I went to the Holy Land and I learned about Dinah and the woman at the well and how they were connected through Shechem, and it changed my life. The woman at the well's Shechem story is literary redemption for Dinah's Shechem story. I visited Shechem on a bucket list trip to Israel with Dr. Reverend Jackie Reese, one of my favorite Bible teachers. Not only is she a friend and a theologian and a fiery Bible preacher, she's on her way to being a Bible scholar. She's also the person who led this trip to the Holy Land. She's the reason I wanted to go on the trip in the first place. This wasn't Jackie's first time in the Holy Land. She was there for the first time in 2005, and Scripture came to life while she was there in a way that led her to seek a doctorate in preaching. And through a tour agency called Morningstar, Jackie was asked to lead a women's tour to Israel. It was on this trip, and in particular in Samaria, that led me on a long journey to trace the story of Dinah and the woman at the well. And it all came from a moment on this tour with Jackie. So I wanted you to hear from her and why Samaria was so important for us to visit while on this trip. You take these women on the trip, and you created, you helped create the itinerary. Yes. And you chose to go to Samaria. And I'm curious why. Why Why did that make the itinerary? Well, I wanted to go to Samaria because I love the story of the woman at the well. I think her story is so redeeming to women in particular, but, but also to anybody who's been um, marginalized or lives in a, a more vulnerable state in their community for a variety of reasons, race, ethnicity, gender, poverty. I mean, there's just classism. So yeah, I I wanted to go and I wanted to talk about her story. I want you to help me jog my memory because I remember being in modern day Samaria with you. I remember having to ride an armored bus. Yes. I remember that bombs were going off in Gaza. I remember that President Trump was in Jerusalem and I can't remember why. He moved the um, embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And so there was a lot of disruption right. during that time frame that we were there. Yeah. So I remember feeling a little on edge. I've never <laughs> ridden in a, uh, you know, it was Mother's Day. I remember that. Right. And I remember thinking, I'm very far away from my family. If something happens, that's, the you know, last year's Mother's Day was the last one. <laughs> and I think I'm on an armored bus. And I think this is such a strange opportunity. But when we get to the location in Samaria, do you remember it was so windy and we were like in a half amphitheater, kind of off the side of a cliff or a mountain overlooking modern day Samaria. And I also remember, Jackie, wasn't there a weird 
like police officer yes. or someone that interrupted our time. Then yes. we all felt so unnerved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a group of soldiers that showed up and uh, they just kind of slowly walked around us and kind of came to the one side of us. And I remember looking at the guy who was with us and, and you know, he lives in Jerusalem, or Israel. And I was like looking at him. I'm teaching in the middle of this as they come down the side of the mountain, you know, and I'm, lo- I'm watching because um, I can see them in a way that you guys can't because you're, you know, facing me and I'm facing them. And I and I look at Ronnie and I'm like, uh, are we OK? Should I keep going? And he's like, yeah, we're OK. Okay. And I've been in many situations like that before, not only in Israel, but my husband works in South Sudan where we're always with armored cars and military. So I've learned very quickly to like listen to people on the ground. So when Ronnie said, we're okay, I was like, okay, we're okay. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> is this devotional time about to come to a very strange end? Like, is it all going to end here today? It did not. For all of you listening, it did not. We're still here. <laughs> so I want to share with you what I remember most is that I think Ronnie got up first, right? He got up. Mm-hmm. He said, here's where we are. Here's what we're looking at over this cliff. And he said, just remember, this is where Dinah's story would have happened. And all of a sudden, I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? What? Wait. <laughs> I don't even remember Dinah's story. So while you're opening your message to the woman at the well, you may remember that I was just flipping, 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 trying to get to Genesis and figure out where was Dinah's story, jog my memory. So while you're talking about the woman at the well, I'm reading about a different woman at the same place hundreds of years before, same well. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your message that day. We don't have time to dig into absolutely everything about this woman's story, but there's so many layers that are connected. You know, for the woman at the well, which we are overlooking, basically, Samaria, Shechem, we're looking where Jacob's, where they assume Jacob's well would have been in general. And she meets Jesus at Jacob's well. And this is significant, This is where Abraham was when the covenant was made. This is where Joseph was. This is where Dinah was with Jacob, her dad, in Genesis chapter 34. It's where she was raped. Dinah was raped in this land that we're overlooking on that cliff. And the text in Genesis chapter 34 tells us that her father didn't do anything about it. And I think that's profound. Many of us have experienced domestic violence, sexual exploitation, and those in power to do something about it have done nothing about it. We resonate with this very well. So I hear this message. The weird police officers have now left the scene in modern Samaria (laughs) when we're there together. I feel a little bit more focused to concentrate on what you're preaching. I've still got my thumb physically marking Genesis 34. So I'm tracking with you and your message, and yet I'm thumbing Genesis 34 and reading it and going, wow, Jackie's pointing out the longest recorded conversation in the New Testament with a woman at the well. Dinah, I don't see her talk she does at not all speak. in her chapters. She's silent. She's silent. We never hear from her. Right. That's when my mind was open to recognizing places in the Bible. Because yes, Jesus came to redeem the woman at the well story, but I think it even was bigger. He came to redeem the stories of women in that place for centuries before that had been mistreated. And I really think the woman at the well got what Dinah deserved. Yes. Yes. She got dignity, respect. She got an audience for her pain. She had someone to help her process through that. All things that are absent in Dinah's story. If she was given voice even, right? Like given voice. Dinah had no voice. She was given voice. Voice is a, a way of defining our humanness. I'm curious, Jackie, how women responded. I mean, you know how I responded to that message. I wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> <laughs> A great it's book, called by the, the way. <laughs> the in-between place, like 60,000 words based on the inspiration that happened in that moment during your message and in that place. But I wonder, did did women talk to you after about how they resonated with this message? Was there something that you processed after preaching a message in the place? Well, I think this story and many of the others that we did in Israel had huge impact on the women because one— The Bible tends to accentuate the main characters tend to be male. 
So to have these stories like the Samaritan woman told in context and to give like an oh huge framework, it gave them dignity. And they told me that. I, I use the word noble, which means to lift up to dignity and nobility as Jesus intended. And that's what happens when women hear these stories in context of first century Judaism versus from a lens that's male 21st century American, right? Yeah, I mean, women shared that they've been sexually molested. I mean, we know that one out of four women in America experience sexual assault. One out of three women experience domestic violence in their lifetime. And so there were stories like that. And I have some of my own stories. You know, I, I it was a, a memory that came back during this time where I was a young girl. I was working. My parents were crop farmers at the time. And I was working in the fields. And I went to this lady's house that we were having coffee at during a break. And my dad was there and this woman and a group of people that were working. And this woman started making fun of me and my sister. Like, we, they, she called us princesses that we were real, you know, spoiled. And I'm thinking, are you kidding? Look at my fingernails. They're mud, you know. And... Um, and my dad joined in. And it was really uh, hard, you know? And I had forgotten that memory, like I'd forgotten that. And here I am talking about this woman at the well, and I'm thinking, oh, I've, I've experienced this too, you know? And I have been redeemed and loved back by this man called Jesus. Jackie, I remember I was sitting on the front row for this particular message in Samaria. And I remember you processing out loud this memory in the moment. Yeah. I remember it happening in that place. Yeah. And you going, you know what? This story and now connecting these dots, I'm remembering something that I haven't remembered in a really long time. And I think for people who listen to Dinah's story or the woman at the well story, What's so powerful about the scriptures is that we find our own stories in the middle of it. That's right. So I think it was important for me to see you process this memory about your father in Samaria. And then I remember leaving. I remember getting back on the bus and it was more quiet in my memory than any of the other sites we visited. People were, it wasn't a heaviness. It was... I need to think longer about this. And I think things really shifted in people's lives. I know that it did in mine. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I think anytime we tell a story in the scriptures, particularly about someone who's like us on some level, and it goes really deep, deeper than we saw originally, we have to get reflective. And we're tapping things like, sexual immorality, we're tapping shame, we're tapping some of the, you know, belonging, voiceless, some of these topics that are so personal and we've all experienced them on some level. And it does take us and go, I think it takes our breath away is what I really think happens. I think we start to reflect upon the depth of what we just heard, the reality of it for our very own lives. And there's a bit of reverence along with reflection, like, whoa, I did not Mm -hmm. even comprehend the love of Christ. And now I'm like having to grapple with it on a whole new level, I think Mm -hmm. is what we see. It's so brutal. It begins with her rape and then the whole city is demolished Demolished. because the brothers had this vengeful plan that worked. Isn't it interesting that what chapters later, Jacob is concerned that maybe Joseph is dead. And what does he do? Jacob's emotive response is to rip his clothes, to go into mourning, yeah. to say the most um, emotional things that you say when you are grieving and terrified and yeah. destroyed. We don't have any of that. No. 
in this story. And we know that Jacob is a layered, complex character like we all are yes. in our own stories. So this isn't the only part of him. He's not all bad. But in this particular story, wow, the selfishness and self-involved that we've seen over time at the beginning of his story really comes to a crescendo in the story with Dinah. And chapters later, we see what's possible when he grieves. And he doesn't do that for Dinah no. and her situation. No. And oftentimes, I'm not saying there were no emotions or feelings toward daughters, but women were considered property. And what happened here, and this is why they wreck uh, Shechem, right, is because they have wrecked Jacob's property. That's what the mm -hmm. defilement is. That's why it's a concern for Jacob's family. It's a shameful thing for Jacob. It's a, a loss of property because now she can't be married off to the best of the best and all of these things. And so what we see is him responding to property damage. And then they respond with property damage and human damage. And it's, it's massive what they do. Shechem's desire was not for Dinah as no. his love, but to be his own property. Yes. And then later when he says, let's do this deal, yeah. let's go ahead and get circumcised because if we do, all of this property, all of this place and everything in this place becomes ours. So I think there's something fascinating happening, Jackie, that God would intend for Dinah's rapist to be named the same name as the place in which she is abused. Yeah. So there's double Shechem, which that double emphasis should call attention. And then the entire story is really about property ownership and who gets rights to that place. And I think when Jesus shows up in John chapter four, he's like, yeah, I am better than Jacob. And this well, this property, it's all mine. My kingdom, my property is going to look real different. Yes. I mean, Jesus is good news for women. If your audience leaves with any statement that they should have ruminating in their brain, it's Jesus is good news for women. Amen. Shechem is a really bad place. Shechem represents our do not enter zones, the hard places in our lives where tragedy finds us and we just want to escape. Anyone who's endured suffering remembers where it happened. And if suffering happens enough, or in a way that makes the news, the location of the suffering becomes, in a way, an extension of the suffering itself. In a symbolic, driven culture like Dinah's, locations in the Bible didn't just matter. They had meaning. And I've got a Shechem, you've got a Shechem, we all have them. And we have them for different reasons. Mine is nothing like Dinah's. For me, it's the ICU wing of Baylor Hospital, Dallas, where my dad passed away. My dad was known as Ron, Ronald, or Ronnie, and he suffered a lifetime of substance abuse and depression. And in his last few years, a spine injury left him in chronic pain and stole his will to live. And before he passed, he spent several weeks in the ICU unit after trying to shoot himself in the heart. I can't even drive past Baylor Hospital Dallas without reliving the weeks he suffered in the ICU. It is Shechem to me. And I've told that story, our story, so many times that I know the people in my immediate family, they also recognize Baylor Hospital Dallas, not just as a pin on the map. It's a place I never want to go again. But here's the good news. Shechem doesn't stay a bad place forever. We need our terrorizing places to be redeemed. We need our Savior to show up there. And I think that's exactly why Jesus had to go to Shechem in the New Testament to listen to the woman at the well's story. The Apostle John says in his gospel account that Jesus had to go to Samaria. But you and I know Jesus doesn't have to do anything. What John means by that is Jesus was intent. He had purpose to go to Samaria. And that's the good news for any of us with Shechem's. A Savior's coming to Samaria, and He's going to change everything. 
I want to see the history of this place. I want to get to know it and live in it. So on the next episode, we'll sit down with the Bible Project's Tim Mackey to trace the history of Shechem from the first time it's mentioned in the Old Testament all the way to its mention in the New Testament. That's all for me, folks. Stay curious. Holy Curiosity is a production of Christianity Today. The executive producers are Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper. Leslie Thompson is our producer. Our associate producer is Mackenzie Hill. Audio editing is done by Kevin Morris. Go deeper with me on Instagram at catarmstrong1 or on my website, catarmstrong.com.